Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam amma ba'd ayyul habitifillah The question has arisen <coughs> or the question arises regarding the hadith of Ibn Umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu an Ibn Umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu ala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal umirtu an uqatil al-nas hatta yashhadu an la ilaha illallah وَإِنَّ مُحَمَّدَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَيُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ وَيُؤْتُوا زَكَاةٍ وَإِذَا فَعَلُوا ذَلِكَ عَصَمُوا مِنِّي دِمَاءَهُمْ وَأَمْوَالَهُمْ إِلَّا بِحَقِّ الْإِسْلَامِ وَحِسَابُهُمْ عَلَى اللَّهِ رَوَاهُ بُخَارِي وَمُسْلِمٌ So in this hadith, some of the people, especially Ahl al-Takfir wa Ahl uh, those people, who are extreme in their interpretations. And when we say someone is extreme in their interpretation, it means that their interpretation is outside of Kitab Allah wa Sunnah Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that they've went to Jawaz al-Had, they've went beyond the boundaries, they've went with extremism, with ghulu. And ghulu is not from the deen. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, إِيَّاكُمُ ghulu." Be, beware of ghulu. be careful, beware, ibta'id. Be away from ghulu, extremism. And this is what we find with all, the, with all these contemporary groups and those groups in the past like the Khawarij whose main pillar of Aqidah and creed was to rebel against the Muslim leader, to always be fighting, always spilling blood uh, in the name of their methodology and understanding for, the, for making takfir of... The Muslims for the major sins that they considered them outside the fold of Islam, so they fought. And who did they fight? Not just the common Muslims, but they fought, of course, the leaders. So they were always pretty much in a state of rebellion. This is the, in general, the madhab of the Khawarij. And with our contemporary sects like ISIL or ISIS or Daesh or whatever you want to call them, and Al Qaeda, uh, Al Shabab, Boko Haram, all these groups. And those who claim Salafiyyah but are still really just a version of one of those various jama'at. They may not be a card-carrying member, but their aqidah and creed and their methodology is basically one and the same. That they are the same. They are of the same. Don't get confused and say, well, he calls himself Salafi, or I saw him at such and such lesson, or I think he's like this, or he's very nice, or he speaks very eloquently. La. Al-ibr bi haqaiq laysa bi musamiyat. That the proof of something is in its substance, the reality of its substance, not in its name. So regardless of what they call themselves, they do not represent Ahlul Sunnah and Ahlul Islam in this, with these evil types of actions. So going back to this hadith, we're going to, this is not really a sitting for explaining and going into depth about this hadith, but rather it is just to dispel the shubahat as it was something that came up. So Umar, uh, Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala, and he said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I was commanded to fight the people until they say, till they bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah and that Muhammad is his messenger, is the messenger of Allah, and to establish the prayer, and to pay the zakat, and if they do this, then they will be safe, you know, they will be protected, and safe, in their blood, in their wealth, except regarding the right of Islam, meaning that Islam has capital punishments, وَحِسَابُهُمْ عَلَى اللَّهِ and their reckoning is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning for those sins that, uh, those sins and things that require punishment by the hadood of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that is the haq of Islam. That is Allah's right that they be implemented. For example, taking the life of another person, that Islam, uh, there is a punishment for that kasas, an, an eye for an eye. And... In this hadith, something very important in order to deal with this uh, shuba, and I went through several shurahat of this hadith, but mainly contemporary ones. I didn't really uh, take the time and go through 
some of the more classical interpretations, but these contemporary uh, uh, explanations of this hadith from some of our ulama, they uh, made it by taking those principles of the salaf, they made malachas often, or they made it, uh, they synthesized and summarized those principles as well as codified and helped to uh, the understanding of those classical interpretations. So from amongst those is uh, something that we, we must uh, take heed of to understand that this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is giving us in the context of when it is time when, when jihad is, is present, when jihad is present, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, during times of jihad, and obviously during his sirah, all the times are not times of jihad in the path of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, as is the case with contemporary times, that people tend to make conflicts, make political issues, Regardless of Nam, the state of affairs of the Muslims, Wallahu Musta'an, is weak, and many Muslim lands have been invaded, etc., and the suffering. But again, we go back to the understanding of the Salaf of this Ummah and look to those ulama of Ahl Sunnah, how they interpret those events, and how they look at the harms and the benefits of what's going on. And w whether something is chaos or whether it fits the criterion of jihad fi sabilillah. So this is what we go under the banner of the ulama, the banner of kitab illah wa sunnah to rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when it comes to implementing these great uh, sha'ar al-Islam. <clears throat> so in this context, with this as our background, understanding the ibara where the Prophet Sallallahu said, Umirtu wa nuqatul al-nas hatta yashadu yani ba'd al-bayan wa i'dhar fa huwa yuqatuluhum hatta yaltazimu bideen. So this statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam I've been commanded to fight the people until they bear witness that there's no God where they worship except Allah and that Muhammad is his messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to understand this it means that the people would have been or have been, uh, this is after. So this is why we have to have the con context. And the way we gain context in hadith and verses of the Quran is looking at the explanation from other verses and other texts in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. Because if you were to take and isolate a verse and try to understand it in and of itself as the means all without looking at the whole life of the Prophet Sallallahu And this is why we rely on the ulama ahl al-ilm who have this knowledge, who have been studying uh, the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, putting all this time and energy. It's not a simple task. It's not something you just open the Quran and the sunnah, you read a verse and then you try to implement it based on your understanding. This can lead to great danger. Some things, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ali Imran, some things are very clear. And some, some verses are mutashabihat. فَمَّا الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ زَيْنُ فِي يَعْتَبِعُونَ مَا تَشَبَهَ مِنْهُ إِبْتِغَى الْفِتْنَ وَإِبْتِغَى تَعْوِيلِهِ Allah makes clear that the verses in the Qur'an, there are some things that are clear, and there are some things that have, uh, you could say, ambiguous, you know, that they have more open to interpretation. Except for those people who Allah has favored with that fiqh and basira and ilm to be able to understand that interpretation, the, the correct interpretation. And so those people who have sickness in their hearts, they follow that which is... Uh, the mutashabihat, those things which are more ambiguous in their interpretation, ibtigal fitna, desiring fitna, desiring trial, desiring discord and disharmony and disunity. 
and in order to support their own methodology. And this is the methodology of Ahlul Bid'ah. So we have to be cautious and careful of this. So with regards to the statement of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is in reference to the situation after the community of Islam under the Khalifa or under the leader that they have sent messengers, they have given da'wah and exhausted the means of da'wah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, making clear for the people, calling them to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then if the Muslim leader determines that it is in the interest of the community, jihad fi sabilillah, those conditions are present, then that is for the leader to make that call. But this is after giving the message of Tawheed. And of course in Islam that there are different types of situations. Either those who have been called, meaning by the Muslim leader, not by Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi or Jamaat so-and-so or Jamaat al-Khwan al-Muslimin or whichever group that arises in, in, in the contemporary times to cause discord and disharmony amongst the Muslims and with the other communities and throughout the world, we're not talking about these people who are self-declared leaders, who believe they have authority when in fact they are people of misguidance who misguide the Muslims and misguide and distort the image of Islam. But rather we're talking about established Muslim leaders who the people have bay'ah and the people follow them because they are trying to implement kitab Allah wa sunnah Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam not based on bloodshed and destruction and devastation but based on kitab Allah wa sunnah Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that they have exhausted the resources of, of calling people to tawheed and so forth. So this is in the options that Islam in these case scenarios offers is that the people especially from Ahli Kitab, they can pay the jizya, they can pay the, 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 the tax to the Muslim leader and live in safety and peace in a Muslim land. Or they uh, can choose to fight if that's what they choose, or they can enter the fold of Islam so that it preserves their religion. Unlike other faiths, especially in the past, uh, Christianity, for example, where the case was you either convert or you die. That was it. But Islam, and this is one of the things that attracted me to Islam before I became Muslim, was seeing how the Muslims uh, were, especially in their, uh, in their conquest in Africa and with the spread of Islam in Africa. Some of the different scenarios that happened and this attracted me to Islam because I saw the justice in it and saw that Islam distinguished itself. It showed a higher ground that the reality is, yes, that there is, uh, the reality is, is there's fighting. And human beings will always cease, will never cease to differ and have conflict, unfortunately. That there will always be case scenarios of this. But is there a system of justice, a just war theory? And Islam gives you that. And we end there. This is not an explanation of the hadith, but it is just to give a little bit of background around the topic where there was some shuba. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil.